Good morning, everybody. Welcome at our focus symposium about the role of self-management in the treatment of musculoskeletal disorders. I would like to ask you to self-manage today because for presenters it's really annoying if mobile phones are ringing. So please switch them off. And we all know that physical inactivity is bad uh, for our health. So please feel free to stand if you want to walk a little bit around at the sides uh, if you want. Uh, so self-manage today uh, at this symposium. So first I would like to uh, thank, say thank you to the scientific committee for accepting this focus symposium. And I also would like to thank my co-presenters for joining this focus symposium. And of course, I would like to thank you that you are here this morning, very early maybe. Uh, I did know, do not know what you did last night, but thank you for visiting our symposium. So first I would like, you I would like to introduce uh, the speakers. We have uh, Vinorina Johnston in the middle. She's an associate professor in physiotherapy at the Univers University of Queensland in Australia. We have uh, Julie Richardson. She's a professor uh, in the School of Rehabilitation Science at McMaster University in Canada. And we have Nicola Wall. She's a professor of knowledge mobilization and musculoskeletal health at the University of West England in the UK. And my name is Nathan Hutting. I'm a researcher in occupation and health at the Han University in the Netherlands. So self-management for musculoskeletal disorders. Why are we talking about that subject today? In the last decades, we saw an increase in, in the incidence and prevalence of musculoskeletal disorders worldwide. And at this moment, one in two adults in the American population is affected by a musculoskeletal disorder. So, and it is increasing and increasing. So, um, maybe uh, we have a problem about that. And also, that costs a lot of money. So, here you see the direct costs of uh, several diseases. And on the fourth place, you see the musculoskeletal disorders. So, it co uh, costs a huge amount of money. And when you also take into account the indirect cost, for instance, for uh, absenteeism, work absenteeism, then musculoskeletal disorders are at the first place uh, with regard to costs for society. So it is a huge problem. And maybe self-management can help us to overcome this prob problem. And maybe we can use self-management in our treatment uh, to uh, provide better results to our patients and, and also cost-effective results. So self-management is about education and support provided by health professionals and or lay leaders to increase the patient's ability and self-confidence in managing their health and well-being. And one often used definition is the definition of Barlow, the ability to manage symptoms, treatment, physical and psychosocial consequences and lifestyle changes inherent with living with a chronic condition. So in self-management, patients are stimulated uh, to be engaged in activities that protect and promote their health. Uh, monitoring and managing the symptoms, managing, managing the impact of the illness on their functioning, emotion and also interpersonal relationships and adhering to treatment regimes. And self-management enables patients to make informed choices to adopt new perspective and generic skills that can be applied to new problems as they arise and also to practice new health behaviors. So self-management interventions may contain activities to strengthen self-efficacy, self-monitoring, making choices, goal setting and action planning, that's one uh, very important part of self-management, patient involvement in their own treatment and cooperation between the patient and the professional. So we have uh, four presentations today. First, Julie will tell you something about integrating physiotherapy into chronic disease self-management. After that, Fenerina will tell something about principles for promoting self-management for workers to return to work. Nicola will tell you something about facilitating activity and self-management in arthritis, and I will tell you something about self-management for employees with complaints of the arm, neck, and or shoulder. After that, I will give a short summary and discuss some of the implications, and we have a question and answer session. So all your questions, uh, please uh, keep them for the question and answer session, and we'll be happy to answer your questions. So, Julie, the floor is yours. Okay, so uh, good morning everybody. Um, so I am going to talk a little bit about um, health service delivery approaches in primary care. 
And in Canada, um, which is where I'm from, um, the, it's only recently, well, in the past two years, that uh, physiotherapists have actually had a role um, in primary care within, within the context of an extended um, inter interdiscipl interdisciplinary uh, professional team. And um, these are often large practices where um, there may be actually one full-time physiotherapist and approximately uh, 20,000 patients. So we, there needs to be ways to think about uh, managing uh, people with chronic conditions and musculoskeletal disorders and ways of um, uh, thinking about risk and um, delivering uh, interventions. So I'm going to talk about uh, uh, several different uh, projects that uh, I've been involved with. Uh, first of all, a scoping review that uh, looks about uh, what is the sort of state of the strategies that physiotherapists deliver. Uh, the second one is an 18-month cohort study that we did uh, delivering an intervention through um, the electronic health record, um, a project on health coaching, um, a clinical trial which um, looked at self-management support with pain science education and exercise, and fi finally, a current project that we're doing around um, app development. So, as Nathan mentioned, the goal of the self-management agenda is to empower patients to actively manage their health issues. And there has been in the literature for a while um, a, a call for greater involvement of rehabilitation professionals and physiotherapists specifically in the management of chronic conditions. But there is no consensus about what are the common elements and principles for the integration of rehabilitation in self-management service delivery. Uh, so we completed a, a scoping review and found that the top three uh, conditions that were being, um, that where self-management was being delivered by physiotherapists <coughs> was in the area of chronic, chronic pain, pulmonary disease, and arthritis. And the uh, types of strategies that were being delivered were uh, around physical activity, strengthening exercises, pain management, uh, energy conservation, and uh, joint protection were some of the things that, uh, strategies that were um, are being addressed. So as I mentioned, um, we've just uh, completed an 18-month uh, cohort study in primary care delivering an intervention through the electronic health record. And there has been uh, written by Kang that if we were to use technology within primary care, we actually might be more effective at understanding the episodic nature of changes in functioning associated with uh, chronic disease. So in this study, um, over the 18 month period, patients completed questionnaires around their functioning um, six times uh, uh, over the 18 months. And they completed questionnaires that related to physical activity, pain, uh, functioning, and preclinical disability. And so we were interested whether um, doing this monitoring actually made a, made a change um, in patients' physical activity level and their physical functioning. We were also interested where, how feasible it was um, in terms of delivering an intervention online um, to uh, people uh, with chronic disease in this way to address issues in functioning that they had. So people completed uh, the questionnaires and then we had developed um, therapist intervention protocols in about 60 areas um, that were uh, evidence-based. And these were then tailored as a result of the results of the questionnaires that the patients completed. And they also re, um, completed the patient-specific functional scale. So as a result of both of those uh, things, the uh, TIPS, as we called them, were tailored to the specific uh, patient's uh, needs and then uh, sent to the patient through the electronic health record. And then the patient and therapist could communicate um, about the issues that they were having uh, with, with the information they were, they were given. So the average age in this study was about six 
64, and um, m most people in the study had at least two or three uh, chronic conditions, and they considered themselves familiar IT users. I'm not sure that we would agree with them about that, but that's how they classified themselves. Anyway, these are the results of the study. Um, and so there were, sig there were two groups, people with chronic disease, 100 people with chronic disease and 50 people without. And uh, there were significant changes over the 18 months and for the patient-specific functional scale and just for the chronic disease group in terms of the physical functioning inventory, which also asked about preclinical uh, disability. However, there was no change in terms of physical activity or in terms of the late life functional disability index. Another way that uh, self-management can be delivered is through health coaching. And this is often used on a one-to-one -one basis with patients that have uh, more complex conditions and have often tried um, group uh, interventions. And these are in, in need a more intensive um, approach. We did a small um, health coaching uh, intervention that was actually a small uh, group-based program. And we used scenarios um, to address, um, uh, to identify positive and negative health behaviors, um, barriers to change, and strategies to produce change. And this intervention was coupled with an exercise uh, circuit and patients attended twice a week for eight weeks. And both self-report and performance measures so, uh, showed positive trends. A clinical trial that, was, that I was involved with that was led by uh, Jordan Miller as part of his PhD um, was looked at chronic pain self-management support with pain science education and exercise. And the idea was that um, a better understanding of pain and why self-management uh, strategies and exercise work may actually increase the conviction or con confidence uh, for change in, for the patient and empower them to lead um, to more effective self-management decisions. So this is the program overview. And you can see here that um, it was twice a week for six weeks, once a week with a group setting and once per week uh, as an indiv individualized contact. <coughs> so it had sort of the, co um, the health coaching component and the group um, component. And the emphasis, emphasis was on gradual increase in activity while controlling symptoms. So the si three components was uh, the pain science education, where uh, pain education emphasized uh, cognitive behavioral or neurophysiological aspects of pain. Um, the individual exercise where it was goal orientated and focused on gaining functional activity, uh, functional abilities while um, also controlling symptoms. And finally, the uh, cognitive behavioral principles that um, looked at progressive goal setting graded exposure, and graded activity. And these all came together to, to give self-management support. And there, so you can see here that in terms of the short uh, musculoskeletal dysfunction index, that patients actually decreased the amount of disability over the six weeks, and so at seven weeks showed improved function, and this was sustained at 18 months. So in thinking at, at the beginning of uh, my talk, I talked about there is not really very much consensus about what the, uh, the, the target or the approach to strategy should be from a physiotherapy uh, perspective. Many of the, most of the, the uh, conditions, chronic conditions that people experience have very different etiology or pathogenesis. However, which is often known as clinical discordance. However, the symptoms that they experience and the, and the things that they talk to us about are often very similar in terms of function, in terms of pain, in terms of fatigue, and uh, inability uh, to be physically active. And so these can be seen as a therapeutic concordance. So physiotherapy strategies are advocated by us 
applies, can apply uh, therapeutic concordance to a multiple conditions and foster approaches that enhance mobility, functional activity and participation. So as a result of this, uh, this type of thinking, we uh, led a, con a national consensus exercise online and uh, used scenarios to ask therapists about what they saw as the priority areas for interventions uh, around self-management for people with chronic conditions. And you can see around the outside of the circle, we identified six areas for prevention, energy conservation, stress management, pain management, exercise and physical activity to manage these things, oh, sorry, on the inside. Oh, sorry, I've just gone back. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, and so at the currently, we are um, developing applications in these areas uh, that can be used, be used by therapists and patients together as part of the total overall uh, interventions that they deliver. So in summary, uh, there is a natural link between physical therapy interventions and self-management approaches, and we need to maximize the use of technology uh, to deliver these approaches in order to be most efficient and also to have a broader reach in terms of our, our important uh, intervention strategies that are going to maximize functions for uh, patients with these conditions. We also need to develop the self-monitoring aspect of self-management as an aid for persons with chronic conditions to identify changes in function and identify when function actually starts to change, as this might be the most efficient time for prevention. And physical therapy and self-management has an important role in pain management, which can result in increased function as an alternative to opioids. And finally, Apps with self-management strategies are tools that can be used by patients and therapists to deliver interventions and maximize outcomes, but we still have a lot of research to do about thinking about how they're best integrated with our overall management and what are the components and the delivery that we should use to, uh, to maximize this approach. Good morning. <clears throat> um, I'm an occupational health physiotherapist, and as an OC Health physio, my interest in self management is how can we promote in workers the skills to help them um, remain at work with a musculoskeletal condition or return to work after an injury? So, the presentation this morning really will provide some practical tips and ideas on how we can do that. The reason that we want to promote self-management in the working population is because we know the opposite of worklessness is associated with many uh, negative physical and mental health consequences, such as increased rates of mortality in cardiovascular disease, lung cancer and susceptibility to respiratory conditions, somatic complaints. There's also a, less, a loss of identity and self-worth. And in addition, there's higher rates of medical consumption, medication use, and hospital admission. And a lot of that research has come out of the UK, so thank you, UK. So the research that I've done and several others around the world have looked at what workers experience when trying to return to work after musculoskeletal injury. And some of the things that they tell us are things like they experience high levels of stigma and discrimination, sometimes because they're blamed for their injury. They experience a lack of understanding of the rehabilitation process and the role of each provider. So if you consider some of the clients that you see in your practice, they probably have several health professionals that they will consult, so the GP, maybe a medical specialist, a physiotherapist, an occupational, um, occupational therapist, a psychologist, and that's even before you start talking about the workplace, the insurer, the regulator. So there are lots of stakeholders in the return to work process. They often experience depression and frustration either because their recovery journey is not on the trajectory that they um, expect, or it's a bit slower than they expect. They experience a sense of powerlessness, so they don't have control about their recovery process, when they can return to work, or what they can do when they return to work. 
they often express difficulty in understanding the legal jargon that accompanies the um, communication that comes from the insurer. Sometimes they get accused of playing the system, uh, perhaps because they're accused of, um, I've just lost my train of thought, playing the system um, using their injury for financial gain. And sometimes it's because they have a lack of knowledge and control of the compensation process. So what workers need to remain at work, so this is what they've told us and the research that we've conducted um, at our university, is that they need skills in promoting positive working relationships. So have a think about some of these skills as I go through them. They need education on how to cope at home. They need skills in prioritising activities in how to best cope with their injury. They need understanding and support of family and friends. They need education about the physical consequences of their injury. They need the ability to be able to stay positive. They need to be able to reinvent themselves. If they can't return to their pre-injury job, if there's a delay in returning to their pre-injury job, they need to be able to reinvent themselves and to think about what else they can do. Are there any transferable skills that they can use? They certainly need peer support at the workplace and the ability to problem solve activities. So how can physiotherapists promote self-management in workers wanting to return to work with a musculoskeletal condition? These are a list of strategies that we can use, certainly not exhaustive, and I'll go through them. So when we talk about establishing rapport, we all use different mechanisms in how to connect with our client. Sometimes it's about finding common ground, so whether it's sport or a leisure activity, family, children, pets, we all talk about something to make that connection and that link. And that's crucial for establishing the confidence that our clients feel in us. So where I come from in Australia, the Indigenous members of our um, community, so the Aborigines, they talk about um, sharing your life story. So it's important prior to even saying and doing anything about their condition and why they've actually come to consult you, you need to uh, reveal, reveal something of yourself. Another way of establishing rapport is to invite a family member or partner to attend the session. You can ask the patient to prioritise their problems. And that is actually sending a really good um, signal to the, the client saying, well, I want to hear from you what you consider to be important. We have assumptions about why people come to see us, but it's important to ask them. And it's always a good time at the first session to seek permission from the client to contact the significant other stakeholders in the um, process. We've probably heard lots about adopting an active listening communication style, so active listening is a process of listening and responding to another person that actually communicates understanding. So it's an ask, tell, ask process where we ask open-ended questions rather than sort of asking a question, how do you feel today? And it could be answered with either yes, good or bad. Um, we have to take care with our body language and tone of voice and make sure that our mobile phone and computer are not in front of us while we're communicating with the client. So the questions could be something like, Tell me what you understand is wrong with you. Or for example, the doctor's giving you a diagnosis of non-specific low back pain. How, what do you understand about that? Or you could ask, tell me what your concerns are about returning to work. Some of the useful phrases for a good listener are things like, how have things been lately? You can encourage them to express their feelings. For example, how did your boss react when you told them that you'd had uh, an injury? And that can often give you an indication of what sort of barriers there may be at the workplace. You could ask for clarification. So they say to you that perhaps, oh, I can't do any of the jobs at work because they're too heavy. So you could perhaps say, well, can you please help me understand why you think that they're too heavy? And of course, you can use open-ended questions to summarise some of the conversations you've had with them. We're very good at providing information and education, but is it the information that they need at the time that they need it? You know yourself that if you're wanting information about something, you may not be ready at that time that you hear it. But it's education not only about pain, but also about the prognosis and the risk of inactivity, and what are the risks and benefits of the treatment that we're proposing? Do we give education and information about managing symptoms at work? Do we talk about work rest cycles? Do we talk about standing up every 30 minutes if they've got a computer-based job? Do we talk about doing a work site assessment? Do we talk about various ergonomic interventions to help reduce the um, physical demands of the job? 
we talk about how to manage flare-ups and work at, um, at the workplace? And do we bust myths? So myth-busting is where we turn negative uh, thoughts into positive thoughts. So this is all about reframing their thinking and getting them to positive, um, positive thoughts. So some of the things your clients might say are things like, oh, I have too much pain, I can't return to work. I can't do that exercise. There are no suitable duties at work, so really I can't return to work. Working will make me worse. My injury is not visible, so people think I'm exaggerating or making it up. So how do we reframe those negative thoughts into positive ones? Well, hopefully you've taught them some skills to manage their pain. So getting them to practice some of this positive uh, self-talk will help improve their self-efficacy for returning to work and staying at work with the condition. They could perhaps say things to themselves like, I'll talk to my boss or my case manager about suitable duties if they think that perhaps there aren't any. It's important for people to realise that once they return to work after, after a period of not being at work, that it's quite normal for symptoms to increase. So that's where the physiotherapist can actually communicate with them that it's quite normal to experience a little bit of an exacerbation once you first return to work, and that's quite normal. And if they say, well, my injury's not visible, I'm accused of playing the system, well, it's true. Some injuries are invisible, like headaches, like migraines, but it doesn't mean that you're exaggerating the problem. So giving them some strategies to turn those negative thoughts into positive thoughts can certainly help increase their self-efficacy for work. Another strategy is to develop an action plan. And it's a collaborative process that we have with the client which helps increase their self-efficacy. But it has to be consistent with the problems that they identify and that they prioritise. The goal must be important to the individual, not to us. It's not what we think that they need. They must be confident in being able to achieve it how confident? Something between seven and 10 on a scale of zero to 10. So if you could ask them, how confident do you feel that you will be able to return to work in four weeks? Is it 70%, 50%? And they'll often give you an idea. So that gives you a starting point. An example of a um, action plan might be return to work on suitable duties in two weeks. So here's an example of an action plan with some SMART goals, and you're probably all familiar with SMART goals. So they're specific, measurable, action-based, realistic, and time-framed. So the end goal would be return to work, say, modified duties, two days uh, a week for three days, for three hours a day uh, for the next two weeks. But to achieve that end goal, there are certain um, steps in the process. So they may need to be able to drive to work to be able to undertake their modified duties, which means sitting. So you might need uh, an, action, uh, a, an action plan or a goal that increases their sitting endurance from, say, five to 15 minutes. Or they have difficulty driving, so you can ask them to rate the level of difficulty that they experience with driving. And another goal might be to improve their physical activity levels. So the SMART goal would be, for example, attending hydrotherapy three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday from 10 to 11. So it's quite specific, it's measurable, and it's time-framed. We need to be able to use a non-judgmental approach, and I'm sure that many of you, like me, are guilty of sort of saying, well, how do you expect to get better if you don't do your exercise? Okay, so rather than saying that, we should try and problem solve and identify the issues that they face in being able to achieve the exercise or the physical activity that they need to be able to improve. So how do we help them problem solve? And it might be something that we do naturally every day, but when you're in a lot of pain and you've had problems with a chronic musculoskeletal condition, problem solving can be quite challenging. So we can help our clients learn the four step process of problem identification so identify the problem, then um, identify some solution. Select one solution that is um, likely to be able to result in some success and that they're confident in achieving on a scale of um, zero to 10, so more than seven. Once they've selected and identified a solution to try, they go away and try it, and then it's important for them to evaluate whether it was effective. So were they able to achieve that, um, that solution? If not, then they need to select another option um, and then try again. If they're not forthcoming, if they can't think of any sort of options or solutions, we can help them generate a menu of options. So going to the restaurant, we have a menu. So we can help them select um, from a, uh, a list. 
And there's evidence to indicate that adding problem solving skills to graded activity for patients with chronic low back pain results in 50% fewer sick days and better work retention in people with low back pain. So there is evidence that problem based, that problem solving skills is effective. Another way that we can promote self-efficacy is to give exercises at a level that the person can do initially. So we need to ensure that they achieve some small successes initially. So rather than giving 10 exercises, perhaps two or three. So short, brief exercises that they can achieve in a, um, uh, quite easily will help build um, their confidence and then lead to mastery and success. It's important that we can link clients with resources. And often they might say, well, I don't like going for a walk and I don't like doing uh, swimming, but there might be other activities that they are interested in doing. So perhaps lawn bowls. Um, it's, do they know what their entitlements are through work or through the insurance scheme? So giving them websites that they can link with or giving them the confidence to be able to ring their case manager and say, hey, I'm a bit um, unsure about my entitlements. I'm, bit concerned about my job security while I'm recovering from injury, what can I do about it? In Australia, and I'm sure in a lot of countries, we have a chronic pain society and that has a lot of resources on their website to help people manage chronic pain. And there's also a really good website called Return to Work Knowledge Base. So that provides information for the lay person as well as the um, professional. We can encourage clients to maintain a personal health record of course, we're always um, um, on the lookout for clients who come in with a, a book which diarises every minute um, incident that occurs to them and every pain and ache that they experience. But on the other end of the spectrum, there's also some clients who have no idea who the case manager is or they have no idea of the name of the occupational therapist or psychologist. So encouraging them to um, maintain a personal health record is a good way for you to be able to communicate with the other health professionals managing their injury. minutes left. Okay, we can also um, have some active follow-up. Make sure that you encourage um, the individual to continue with their exercise, but sometimes they do need some support and that can occur over the phone. So telephone coaching um, has got some evidence in supporting clients returning to work after injury. But of course we know that despite effective rehabilitation, there may still be some barriers in the workplace. And if you're able to, to attend the workplace or to communicate with the employer, it always will result in better and faster results. So when you return to work next week or the week after, have a think about some of the interventions that you're providing to your clients and have this checklist in mind. Do you ask your clients their understanding of their condition? Do you ask them what they understand of the physiotherapy management and how it's going to help them? Do you actually help them develop and document the SMART goals? So writing it down is a very important part of the process of actually achieving that behaviour change. And do you adopt an active listening style? So just to summarise, some workers need and want support to manage the return to work with the musculoskeletal condition. And I think physiotherapists are uniquely placed to promote a worker set and achieve their stay at work or return to work goals using principles of self-management. Thank you. Good morning and <coughs> thank you for the opportunity of speaking today. I'm going to discuss the development of a self-management and education program for arthritis. As Nathan's already alluded to, that musculoskeletal problems are a huge issue. If we think about osteoarthritis, hip and knee OA are the 11th highest contributor to worldwide disability. We know as far as osteoarthritis is concerned that the hip, the knee and the hand are predominantly affected. Equally, we know that older adults, um, so 65 plus, are the second most cons um, common consultants with lower back pain. And this is predominantly due to non-specific and mechanical low back pain. This led to us to consider how we manage individuals with arthritis. The traditional approaches, particularly in the UK, are based on group exercise for the knee, for the hip, and for the back. But these are delivered as separate entities. 
And what this doesn't take into account is the, the common uh, presentation of patients whereby they uh, present with hip pain and knee pain, often associated with back pain as well. So the consideration was that this may be a much more holistic approach to uh, delivering a self-management intervention for arthritis. If we think about the guidelines um, for both of these conditions, what we notice is that both for non-specific low back pain and for osteoarthritis, exercise and education are key to the um, management processes. Therefore, if we combine these approaches, we, we believe that we could develop um, and deliver an intervention that would cover all of these approaches. When we asked healthcare professionals what they considered um, about a combined approach for osteoarthritis for the peripheral joints and back pains, it was generally considered to be a positive idea. So patients have multiple job problems in multiple joints, particularly the older patients. So improving the levels of understanding um, and improving discussions on general exercise may be beneficial. It's a good idea because basically you could be more holistic, not overly focusing on one joint. And as physiotherapists, we don't tend to treat joints, we tend to treat the person as a whole. However, you do notice at the bottom that there was potentially some reticence, um, particularly from a very biomedical perspective, whereby some physiotherapists considered that some of the exercises for knees and hips, for example, may affect people with back pain. So we had to take that in cons into consideration when developing the intervention. The intervention itself was derived from a, a clinically and cost-effective intervention, escape knee pain. So this was originally developed for people with knee osteoarthritis. But what that intervention did show that after two and a half years of a six-week intervention, patients were still experience some benefits to function and pain. The program itself consisted of a six-week group program, uh, twice a week, so 12 sessions of one hour. The program was facilitated by a physiotherapist delivered to patients in groups of about eight patients in primary care. The intervention itself was based on social cognitive theory, whereby we looked to develop the self-efficacy for exercise and for self-management of the individual. And the intervention itself was uh, 35 minutes of group-based exercise and then 25 minutes of group education facilitated by the physiotherapist, but certainly not directed by the physiotherapist. The areas themselves that were covered as part of the intervention were encouraging individuals to um, understand their joint pain and the benefits of exercise, how to set goals and action plans that we've already heard about. Critical was pacing activities, an understanding of a healthy diet, how they could manage their condition with ice and heat, understanding how anxiety and their mood has a direct impact on pain and vice versa, simple relaxation techniques to help to manage their, their pain, a basic understanding of drug management and the different drugs that may or may not be appropriate for their condition, understanding how to appropriately manage flare-ups in joint pain without uh, stopping activities, and how to exercise in the longer term, so an understanding of what was available in, group, uh, in, in the community. The critical thing, as far as the exercises were concerned, was that it was a patient-directed and symptom-responsive approach. Very typically, when we treat patients in groups, particularly with, with exercise, they follow a circuit. Um, and this is very frequently directed by a physiotherapist, often a timed intervention of approximately one to two minutes. Our approach um, considered that this, this wasn't an appropriate way to facilitate self-management of exercise in the long term, because patients just respond to a time that I do this amount of exercise and I simply move on. What we wanted to patients to consider was how their joints were feeling after 30 seconds. And it was appropriate at that time to then maybe stop exercises. So it's very much patient-governed, governed, 
as opposed to physiotherapist directed. And patients also had the ability to document their exercise levels as well. <coughs> and as you can see on the right hand side of the screen, the selection of exercises. So some very general um, aerobic approaches to exercise and then some more very specific exercises related to the joints. Within the class, these were color coded so patients could understand what the exercises were for and which joints they were likely to have a more beneficial effect on. But equally, they were encouraged to um, undertake exercises that maybe um, weren't appropriate to the joint pain that they had. So for example, if they had back and hip pain, they were still encouraged to consider some of the knee exercises, particularly as this would allow them to develop an understanding as what may be beneficial in the future. <coughs> It's really important as well to consider a theoretical framework upon which an intervention may work. So in collaboration with our colleagues um, in the Republic of Ireland um, who were developing a very similar inter intervention at the same time, we considered how our phase R intervention may have an effect. So what we wanted to achieve from the intervention was self-management through exercise and education. What we consider to be the, the determinants of those um, to allow this behavior to, to change were knowledge of their condition, the skills to actually undertake self-management. We wanted to try to regulate an individual's behavior, overcome some of the fear they may have of movement and the catastrophizing that we see in certain patients. We wanted them to feel competent in their ability to actually perform exercise and self-management and to feel motivated to do so. The behaviors, therefore, that we wanted to achieve were adherence to, to these approaches to facilitate self-management and increase physical activity. And the outcomes through which we assess this were physical, psychological, and economic, because these are important to the healthcare systems. But in the UK, when we develop self-management interventions, we're also encouraged to develop them according to Susan Mickey's behavioral change taxonomy. So we also mapped with the intervention and its contents according, the, according to the theoretical domains framework and the behavioral change taxonomy. So as you can see on the left-hand side of the slide were the domains that we affected through the intervention. So the capability beliefs, so the competence for self-management. Beliefs about the consequences. The emotions, so to reduce fear. To increase an individual's knowledge and understanding of behavior. To develop proficiency in the skills of self-management. And to improve their motivation to engage in self-management activities for intentions uh, and, and goals. And also to regulate the behavior in the long term, so strategies to continue to manage change. And on the right hand side, you can see the uh, interventions that we used in order to achieve that. So we've heard already about the importance of goals and plans, to provide feedback to individuals and to monitor the condition, social support, both within the group and externally, and how we could consider repetition and substitution in act activities and the antecedents of the condition. And as we work through all of those uh, domains, that you'll see that lots of those groupings and interventions are repeated. So the phase R study itself considered the intervention versus standard uh, GP management. And that could be anything ranging from just continued GP care to uh, physiotherapy interventions that weren't the phase R intervention. We recruited eight primary care physiotherapy units within Southwest England. And our primary outcome measure was the short musculoskeletal functional assessment, which may be new to some of you, but this allows um, individuals with multiple joint presentations uh, to be considered against each other. The problem we have very frequently in these types of trials is that many of our outcome measures are associated to individual joints, so be that the hip, the knee, or the lower back, whereas this is a very generic functional measure. 
And importantly, we wanted a measure of self-efficacy as well. Our intervention was based on social cognitive theory. Therefore, therefore from a process perspective, it was important to measure an individual's self-efficacy. And we treated almost 350 individuals to the trial, and you can see the demographics there. The preliminary outcomes of the study suggested that um, it had a significant impact on function at six months, and we saw improvements across all subgroups. So individuals with a hip and knee pain only, lower back pain, and the combination of low back pain and hip and knee pain. What we also notice is a significant uh, improvement in self-efficacy across all groups as well. And this was really important because it allowed us to, um, to demonstrate that the process of um, basing the intervention on social cognitive theory, we were able to demonstrate that self-efficacy actually improved over that period of time. Unfortunately, we saw uh, non-significant differences in all other uh, psychosocial outcomes and pain. However, our intervention wasn't based on altering an individual's pain. It was to allow an individual to live with their pain more appropriately. From the patient's perspective, the intervention was considered acceptable and incredibly positive. So tomorrow you can have another pain and you would more have more of an idea of knowing what to do with it if it was in a different area of the body. Within the groups, most individuals never thought about people having pains in different parts of their body. They just had pain and they were exercised, there to exercise in order to feel better. And there were different people there with different pains, but we were all in pain, so some, some sort of, it didn't really matter. However, there were some reservations amongst some patients. So for me, it was difficult because I struggled to relate to the experiences of other people. I just think we've all got different things wrong with us, and I wanted something more specific. Really interestingly, the negative comments that we had were exclusively from low back pain participants. So only two, actually, out of the 45 people that were interviewed. But they were exclusively people with low back pain. But if we reflect back on the outcomes I presented a minute ago, the low back pain patients did just as well as, peripheral, as people with peripheral joint pain. So in summary, we can suggest that we have a clinically effective intervention at improving function for people with peripheral and low back pain. We've manualized the intervention to facilitate its delivery and fidelity in the longer term. We've mapped the intervention to behavioral change theory and identified the techniques that we use in order to affect an individual's self-efficacy. We've measured, measured the psycholo psychological process, and we noticed that self-efficacy significantly improves, therefore maps the social cognitive theory. On the whole, our intervention is acceptable to both patients and clinicians, and it remains under further, further investigation on the clinical and cost-effectiveness of the intervention. I'd just like to acknowledge the people involved in the delivery of the study and our funders, and also my colleagues in Ireland, the Solis team, <coughs> who also um, developed an intervention simultaneously. Thank you. Thank you speakers because you are right on time, so your health management is excellent. However, I heard one mobile phone, I saw nobody standing, so you have to improve your self-management. So if you want, would like to stand for a minute, please do so. But this is not self-management because now I tell you to do, so. <laughs> and you can stand as long as you want. So I'm coming to tell you something about self-management for employees with complaints of the arm, neck, and or shoulder. So what are those complaints uh, called cons? They are musculoskeletal complaints of the arm, neck, and or shoulder, not attributable to an acute trauma or systemic illness. And they have a prevalence of 
five to 40%, that is dependent of the population that you are measuring in. In some companies, there is a high prevalence of those complaints. And the prevalence of chronic uh, cons, longer than three months, is 19, 19%. And of those 90%, 60% of those people report use of past, uh, use of healthcare facilities in the past year. So that also costs a lot of money. In my research, I focused on non-specific cons. In uh, non-specific cons, a specific diagnosis cannot be made and a specific anatomical structure is not affected. And that is the case roughly in 70 to 90% of all people with cons, so it's a huge problem in cons. Maybe you, know, you don't know the term cons, and maybe you know repetitive strain injuries, work-related upper limb disorders, uh, neck and upper extremity complaints, they're more or less the same, but in Holland we uh, call it cons. So in the etiology of cons, uh, physical factors, psychosocial factors, and personal factors play a role. And uh, they play a role uh, in every patient, but um, it can vary uh, how much they play a role in every patient. Maybe in one patient there are only physical factors involved, and in another patient there are more personal factors involved, so that can be different between patients. However, the patients, the patients have to face a lot of things in their life when they have cons. They have to deal uh, with the situation at home. They have to perform sport activities. They have a social network with the, uh, they have to deal with. They have maybe the, uh, they are undergoing some treatment by a physician or by a physical therapist. And they also have to manage their work. So they are in the center and around them there are a lot of things they have to deal with and they have to manage. So. In the beginning of my research project about self-management, we conducted some focus group interviews with uh, employees, with cons, and also with experts. And I would like to share some of the results with you. So, people with cons have to deal with pain and disability, but they also have to deal with fatigue. And I was, as a physical therapist, I was not so aware of uh, fatigue in this population, but it also opened my eyes that fatigue plays a major role. And um, one of the other outcomes was that people with cons had an insufficient insight in their complaints and also are unaware of the possibilities how they can influence their complaints themselves. They often go beyond their own limits and they have a high threshold for asking for help. And they also uh, experience difficulties in managing um, their complaints but also in managing their work. So. Our conclusion, and also the conclusion of the experts in the focus group, was that a behavioral change was considered important in these patients. So using the intervention mapping program, which is a stepwise approach for uh, developing intervention, we developed a self-management intervention for the target population. We called it control cons, in Dutch is grip op cons, and it consisted of self-management sessions and an additional e-health module. The self-management sessions were ses uh, six sessions, of two and a half hours. And this is the content of our sessions. So we were addressing workload and work capacity, one's qualities, pitfalls, challenges, and allergies, time management, dealing with pain and fatigue, stress and stress management, muscle relaxation exercises, sizes, how to obtain a healthy lifestyle, exercise and sports, the use of facilities within their working environment, uh, communication skills, working with others and asking for help, help, and dealing with negative emotion and also uh, positive thinking. We also had this additional e-health module, uh, which, pay, which people could uh, use. And on that, uh, we uh, provided information about the differences between specific of specific cons and non-specific cons, about symptoms, causes of cons, about workload and capacity, physical factors, uh, psychosocial factors, and personal factors about chronic pain, uh, central sensitization, and also we had some self-tests and screening tests on the website. It was also about the prognosis of cons, what people could do, could do themselves, about their workplace, their work stress, and uh, most important, stress reduction, of course, and uh, also about physical activity and sports. We also had movies of uh, several exercises on the website, so they could uh, use that and also uh, print them out and download them also. And we also addressed uh, the facilities at work and uh, treatment options. So it was already said by some of the previous speakers, but goal setting is considered very important. So every session people had to make their own goal and they also made a long-term goal 
um, for all the sessions. So it's very important. And but was explained, you have to score above seven, otherwise you have to choose another goal. So we conducted a randomized control trial to uh, look or our, if our program was effective. So we had the self-management group and the usual care group, and we measured uh, outcome measures at three, six, or 12 months. We found no uh, significant difference at our outcome measure, the DES, disability of the arm, shoulder, hand questionnaire, and on the DES work module, we found a between group effect of uh, almost minus four in favor of the self-management group. So they scored uh, better on the DES work module. With regard to experiences, uh, experience limitations at work, the between group effect uh, was minus one in favor of the self-management group. On all the other outcomes, we did not find any significant changes. And we also have to realize that um, significancy is not everything. Uh, changes that we uh, have must also be clinically important. And I think these uh, results are not clinically important because four uh, points on a scale of zero to 100 is not clinically important. So <coughs> this was a little bit disappointed if you're looking for great results. However, fortunately, we also uh, performed uh, qualitative uh, research consisting of questionnaires and interviews. And that revealed that our p p uh, participants were satisfied uh, with the intervention, they experienced benefits, they were able to apply uh, what they have learned into practice, and they would recommend the intervention to their colleagues. So our conclusion was that at least the intervention met the needs and expectation of our participants. And I have a lot of thoughts why we did not show any results in our RCT, and I'm happy to discuss that with you afterwards, but because that costs a lot of time right now. So the added value of self-management. I think self-management can play a major role also in physiotherapy. We can um, uh, develop self-management uh, courses, which um, in physical therapies can be uh, leaders. We can also uh, develop additional uh, online modules of self-management that we can use in our practice. But I think we can also use self-management within our uh, private practices. So we had this, this program and we also uh, made use of a uh, behavior change model, the ASE model. And that, that contains the attitude, the social influence and the self-efficacy of the patients. So we wanted to change the attitude, the social influence and the self-efficacy. And therefore the intention must be there by, the, by patients and they also have to perform action planning. And we try to overcome their barriers uh, using the self-management sessions. And we also provide knowledge and skills to ev eventually um, uh, uh, obtain uh, self-management behavior at work, because that was our main goal. So behavior change is uh, very important, and um, related to the ASE model, we selected methods and strategies how to, uh, uh, how to change uh, the behavior of our participants. And I would like to present a case um, in which I have included those um, methods and strategies. And perhaps you can use some of those methods and strategies also in your practice. So I have this woman, Mrs. X, she's 46 years old. She's a secretary in a large company, experiences neck shoulder pain for eight months. And the com the, uh, her complaint started after um, organizational restructuring. X-rays showed no abnormalities. She's married and has two children and one child recently sees his MSc education. So there are some barriers for recovery. She continued her work because she's afraid of losing her job. She experienced also a lot of pain and also uses pain medication. She has also a poor sleeping, stopped the usual fitness routine due to the pain, and she also has uh, perfectic, perfect, she's also very perf perf perfectionistic. It's a difficult word. And she also has a high threshold for asking for help. Previous treatments had little effect, and she also feels misunderstood by her general practitioner. So here are possible methods and strategies. So first, belief selection. So beliefs are identified with regard to load and capacity, the multifactorial cause of the complaints and the effect of exercise. Also new beliefs are introduced, Positive beliefs are strengthened and uh, negative beliefs are weakened, so that's very important. 
I think one of the most important things is goal setting. So um, she has to formulate achievable long-term goal and also short-term short -term goals. And you can do that also in your private practice, of course, because people come back every week or something like that. So she also discusses her goals and her progress with her physical therapist, but also at home with her husband. So that will also enhance the results of her uh, self-management. And she also receives feedback from the physical therapist and also at home, I hope, from her husband. So she also uh, can do her advantage with that. It's also important to stimulate communication to mobilize social support. So through information about communication and uh, practical skills, she stimulated to discuss her complaints and needs with her supervisor and colleagues and to ask for help if, uh, if, if needed and also support. So that's very important. And maybe I think it's also important to address that in physical therapy. And she receives also information about her complaints, possible causes and barriers for recovery. Consciousness raising is also important. So re she received feedback and she's more aware of all the factors that are involved in the cause and persistence of her complaint. And she's also aware of the possible actions she could, uh, uh, could take and also about possible solution, solutions. And she's also uh, become, became aware of her behavior in relation to risk factors for her complaints and barriers for recovery. It's important to know that otherwise you cannot change, of course. Active learning, skill training is also important. And I think we as physiotherapists are using that, of course. So she stimulated to learn on basis on her action plan, receives advice and training with regard to communication, muscle, muscle relaxation exercises, and also specific exercises. And she also monitors her behavior herself. So here are some uh, possible specific goals. Creating insight in the causes and persistence of her complaints. Discuss complaints, barriers, and needs at work and at home. Self-evaluation of the workplace and to apply for a workplace assessment. Workplace or work adaptations. Resume physical activity. Perform specific exercises. Reduction of pain medication. Undertake relaxation activities. And getting insight and perhaps modify, but that's maybe difficult, her perfectionistic behavior. So self-management is something that we have to do. Uh, and everybody has to do it. Not only me, not only you or you, but we have to do it ourselves. Everybody, I think we can integrate self-management within our physical therapy practice. And you just have to start with it if you are not started already with that. So I would like to acknowledge my colleagues who were involved in this research. I would like to acknowledge the funder of the study and the funding institution that funded my traveling and accommodation here in this beautiful city, Cape Town. Thank you. So, before we go to our question and answer session, I would like to discuss some points with you. First, I will give you a little bit uh, um, an overview of what we discussed today. So there's a natural link between physical activity interventions and self-management approaches. PTs need to maximize the use of technology to deliver self-management approaches and also need to develop self-monitoring aspect of self-management as an aid for persons with chronic condition to identify changes in function. And PT and self-management has an important role in pain management. And apps with self-management strategies are tools that can be used by patients and therapists to deliver intervention and maximize outcomes. Some workers uh, need and want support to manage return to work after musculoskeletal condition, and physiotherapists are well placed to help workers uh, set and achieve their return to work goals using principles of self-management. And self-management interventions should be based on sound health behavior change theories, a variety of behavior change techniques can and should be used to facilitate the development of self-management skills. And the behavior change taxonomy provided a basis, provides a basis uh, for intervention development. Exercise intensity and duration should be guided by patient reflection rather than physiotherapy's prescription. I think that's also an important one. So self-management program for employees with cons should uh, address physical, psychosocial and personal factors. Um, the self-management intervention met the needs and expectations of the participants, and PTs can use uh, behavioral change techniques in order to facilitate self-management. 
and um, self-management can have added value in PT practice. There are some recent articles that I would like to share with you, and I will discuss them very shortly in one or two sentences, so you can uh, look them up if you are interested in, uh, in what I'm telling you. So, one of the conclusions of this article was that self-management program can be regarded as an effective approach for chronic low back pain management. And in addition to a face-to-face -face mode, internet-based strategies can also be considered as a useful option to deliver self-management program. And group-based physiotherapy-led self-management intervention for osteoarthritis and chronic low back pain are as clinically effective as individual physiotherapy or usual medical med management. And if healthcare providers will use self-management principles to achieve behavior change in their patients, training and upgrading of the skills of these clinicians seems important to learn them how to support patients in their self-management behavior. So not only the patient should be educated, but also the clinician uh, himself should be educated. And this, this article highlights that there was a low, there are low levels of reported participation in formal self-management program. And people may benefit from a more proactive intermediate uh, model to support self-care and effective use of resources early in the disease continuum. So I think that physiotherapists are ideally placed to deliver this. We can integrate self-management principles within our practice. Um, we are easily accessible for patients, so I think it's an opportunity for physiotherapists. And this study um, showed that physiotherapists regularly spend time prescribing self-management strategies, such as exercise advice and the use of heat or ice. And that suggests that self-management is considered to be an important adjunct to in-clinic physiotherapy. And I agree with that, but I also think that uh, self-management is so much broader than exercise advice and the use of heat or ice. So I think we have to provide uh, patients with uh, uh, long-term skills and also include uh, psychosocial aspects of their condition in our self-management strategies. So, but it's a start, I think. So, this is the road. I don't know where you are standing on that road. Maybe you are in the beginning of that road and you're, you're starting with self-management, and maybe you are at the end of the road uh, and already include the self-management in your treatment. However, as I mentioned before, we have to do self-management ourselves, and that can, I think, it can enhance our results of our treatments. So, now, we have some room for questions and answers, and maybe also some discussion. I think this, this topic also can raise some discussion. So, if you have a question, can you please go to a microphone and please uh, tell us your name and where you come from and ask a question? Are there any questions? No questions. Then, where? Oh, sorry. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Thank you for your presentations. Uh, uh, my name is Ulfat Mohamed from uh, California State University of Long Beach. Um, uh, two things. Uh, one, what are your thoughts and your strategy to promote adherence to the program? Uh, that's one of the things that we struggle with. People are excited about uh, starting, and then um, by time, they fade away. Uh, the other is the use of technology. Do you s how do you facilitate this, especially in older adults? And uh, how, um, how do you um, educate them on, on the use of technology? Thank you. Um, well, some, some strategies that we've used um, is, um, first of all, booster sessions once they've finished. So um, having periodic workshops as booster sessions afterwards, um, that's one. And then the other thing that I think is written up a lot in the literature, and we've used it with uh, people with diabetes, is telephone, te telephone contact. So, um, you know, um, having uh, organized telephone times that you would contact them to see how they're getting on in their goal setting and their action <coughs> plan and reviewing strategies that they're using and also barriers. And just before I, I let uh, somebody else can 
for that. Um, around the technology, I think um, that's really a cohort-based uh, issue. So for older adults, um, that's why I sort of said when I was going through um, my presentation that we actually got people, we used a standardized approach to get people to uh, classify themselves as to what sort of user they were, whether they were experienced or not. And um, certainly for the older adult, um, it, for some people it is a struggle. And even though they classify themselves as being, you know, experienced users, they needed uh, a lot of assistance from a research coordinator. So um, I think that that's something we need to make. It, we, when we think we've got it really simple, we need to make it 10 times simpler in terms of the number of steps that they need to uh, do to actually access it. So um, I, I'm still in the process of you know, sorting through that. We've just done a, a mobility trial with uh, self-management and we used a website. We dealt, developed a fabulous website and the majority of the older adults would not use the website. They wanted their um, folder with the paper thing. So that, uh, that's a work in progress as far as I'm concerned. very frequently that um, patients develop a real coherence loop within their group after six weeks and want to continue that group support. Um, so one of the ways we work with our local leisure centres um, to provide a very similar program to the one that's delivered by a physiotherapist within the local leisure centres. Um, and the role of the physiotherapist within that is firstly to provide training for the exercise professionals in uh, the same skills that we're developing and facilitating in patients in self-management, um, and also the same approach to exercise prescription as well, where the patients are very reflective um, on their symptoms. And uh, that's offered on, on a kind of as a pay-as-you-go basis, so individuals can kind of dip in and out um, as they want to, but it's, it's a program that's therefore familiar to them, and they tend to continue in the longer term. Telephone coaching has been used a lot, and uh, a lot of my colleagues in Australia use that to help uh, with promoting uh, return to work. Next um, question. Yep. Uh, hi, I'm Gail Fowden from the UK. I'd like to uh, thank you for some very interesting and clear presentations. Um, Hubert, you suggested that you had some ideas about why your RCT didn't show more positive results. I wondered if you could share those with us. Sorry, I was asking whether you could share your thoughts okay. about why your control trial didn't show more positive results. Yeah, I think um, one of the main um, causes is that uh, we asked, of course, the uh, participants to formulate their own weekly goals. So everybody was working on different <coughs> goals. And I think they achieved their goals of course, because they were confident that they could achieve their goals and they were working on it. But I think, so they were, they were quite happy with, the, with, with, with their results and also with the intervention, but because they were working all at different, different parts, uh, s somebody was uh, talking with his employer, other, other, other persons were doing exercises, I think um, that is not captured within our outcome measures. And they, 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 when somebody is doing this, somebody is doing that, then it all will uh, have a regression to the mean or something like that. So uh, at the end, there were no significant, not much significant results. So I think that's one of the main reasons um, that, 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 that we were not successful in uh, showing bigger re results. Uh, so, and I think in every uh, intervention, it's quite difficult to to achieve very good results in physiotherapy also. But I think, yeah, because we, uh, they have to formulate uh, uh, their own goals, I think that's one of the main reasons that we do not find uh, results. Yes? Thank you. Uh, good morning, panel. Um, Kay Stevenson from uh, the UK. Uh, thank you for great presentations this morning. Really, really super and have given us a lot of uh, food for thought. My, my comment or question to you as a panel is, is really there seems to be a natural uh, progression towards the use of apps and websites, 
But what is your thoughts around the evidence that underpins that? Do we actually know that these strategies for improving self-management actually, actually work? Evidence underneath it. So, so you, just to make sure that I'm answering your question. So, you, what you're asking is, are we sure that the strategies are evidence informed or evidence based that we're actually um, delivering through the different technologies? Yeah. Okay. Um, well, for the work, I can just speak for the work that uh, I'm doing. Certainly, we we absolutely make sure that they're, they're evidence based to go forwards. Um, so uh, we would actually identify what level of evidence we are including um, and it, so that we know, you know, whether it's, you know, high or, or medium or low level evidence. Um, and obviously in some areas that there's stronger evidence than others. Um, but I think that, that's, that, that it is important um, that, and I think uh, Nicola and I sort of alluded to that, a little bit that, you know, a lot of the strategies that we use are more generalizable than we, than often we sort of, uh, the way that we approach it. And it's important that it's gen generalizable. It's important that it's tailored at the same time, but we can't be reinventing things. Uh, do you know what I mean? For every specific group, because a lot of what we do is the strategies that we use are for pain or for function or for things are very similar and they can be applied across different chronic conditions. I think really interestingly, Claire, that um, when we looked at apps available for people with osteoarthritis and tried to map them to Mickey's behavioral change work, we found it very difficult to actually um, understand the behavioral change theories that were actually being integrated into apps and, and the processes through which individuals were um, being encouraged to self-manage. So, so I'd say in, in lots of apps that are available, then it's a very limited theoretical approach and, and, and a very limited um, functionality to support self-management. Okay, microphone one. Thank you, my name's April. I'm from the United States, but I work in Iraq. And many of you talked about the behavioral change model. And my understanding is that a patient needs to have like a certain readiness for change for like a behavioral change approach to be effective. So can any of you talk about like, do you have a assessment to assess the readiness for change? Do you turn people away until they're ready for change and how you um, apply that in your clinical approach? So in the cohort study that I described, we used a readiness ruler um, and so we tend to use those in our, in our trials now, where we assess readiness for change throughout the, throughout the trial, so to see whether it you know, fluctuates or changes over time. Um, in the research that we've done in Australia, we actually use the readiness for change model for return to work. And uh, like the results that uh, Nathan found, we found that uh, we didn't have a significant difference in those who participated in the self-management program. And we suspect the reason is that a lot of them weren't ready and they were too far down the um, chronic pain pr um, uh, process to be able to uh, effectively respond and engage with the self-management strategies. So yeah, it's, it's a good point. <coughs> really based intervention on the motivational interviewing approach whereby you identify um, where an individual is at with regards to, to their, their motivation to engage in, in uh, self-management um, and then work accordingly depending on exactly where they are in that process. Yes, and... and, and Thank you. Um, I'm Adishola Odole from University of Ibadan, Nigeria. I actually have two questions. Um, I want to find out how one can actually ensure that these self-management approaches are properly carried out and done by the patient. This is something different from adherence. How do you ensure that these interventions, these strategies are properly done by the patient? That's the first question. Then um, I want to find out about individualizing these approaches. Have you given considerations to how these approaches can be individualized to patients? Thank you. Part of the 
question. So how do we ensure that self-management interventions are properly carried out? F for me, um, it's important that the individual kind of carries them out in the way that they want to carry them out and, and adapts them to the way that works for them. Um, I personally don't think we, we should be dictating the approach through which individuals are choosing to use the strategies, but we just support them um, in, in using the, the strategies that, um, and the skills that we provide them with in the most appropriate way for them. I, I'm really sorry, I didn't hear the second part of the question. Well, I, I think that um, a, a number of us actually um, use the patient-specific functional scale um, in, in our studies. Um, so I think that is uh, one way of identifying the priority that different um, issues have for people. Um, so I think uh, with that, um, you know, you have to think about what, what you know about the evidence about various strategies that might be effective in relation to the goals that people have identified and then think about, you know, how you would just ta suggest that they tailor it for themselves. That, that's the approaches that we've taken. I don't know. Um, some of the strategies that I went through in my presentation can certainly be used in a one-on-one -on -one consultation with the client, so that's a... a some strategies there for individualizing self-management. Yes, in, in addition, I think in the, uh, that I also gave the example of how you could use some of the methods and strategies within a one-on-one -on -one treatment. However, you're always missing um, other participants, and we also know that the group discussions, peer-to-peer, uh, -peer are also very important, but that's something you miss in one-to-one uh, -one self-management but maybe uh, you can also um, uh, make some groups within your practice so they do, they do can exchange their experiences with other patients. Good morning, my name is Susan Grobler. I'm from Pretoria in South Africa. I just want to say you all look musculoskeletally healthy, healthy and self-managed. So on, on this I want to say, is there any study that have a correlation? between the self-management of the therapist herself as leading by example and the results. I think it's good if you can share your own experience and say, I've lost so much, I've started exercising, this is what I experience and I lead by example. So if you have a physiotherapist that's not self-managed herself, she will not get the same results in studies like this. They're all looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think you agree. Um, I, I, agree I, I agree, and uh, I, I don't know if there are any studies on this uh, topic. I don't know them, but I think that in order to provide good self-management support to your patients first, as a physiotherapist, you, has to, you have to know what self-management is really about. And of course, uh, you also have to be an example, uh, I think. So. Um, you, you can also show and tell patients what you are doing yourself and maybe you can give personal examples because we, also, we, all, we, we, we all have to self-manage uh, in, in this world. When you have a busy job, uh, I also have to self-manage. So I think you can also share your personal experiences and, uh, but I, I think it starts with good knowledge um, by the physiotherapist about self-management. Um, but I don't know if there are any studies on this. Okay, yes. Hi, I'm, um, yep. I'm Taryn Jones, I'm from Australia. So I've worked in self-management uh, for a while, but more in the neurological sphere, so mainly with uh, stroke um, patients, and um, thought I'd sort of share a couple of things that probably um, come from that world. I think I definitely agree with Nicola in that um, the way people interact with self-management support is a completely individualised thing and I think it's really important when we're considering a discussion around self-management that we recognise that there's no one-size-fits-all approach. Some people will like group approaches, some people will like individualised approaches. Um, the program that I've developed and worked on is actually completely remotely delivered 
individualised programs um, because access to stroke self-management programs is really, really small. Um, so we developed something where it was able to be accessed and we've now translated that to a program that's working with um, transdiagnostic in over 65s and still managing to do that remotely, um, so via email and, and telephone predominantly. Um, and I'm finding that, you know, a, just a different option. It doesn't suit everyone, um, but I think it is important to consider that there's never going to be a one-size-fits-all approach for such a complex intervention when we discuss self-management. And so having lots of different options that people can tap into um, for things that suit them. In the same way that you can also look at generic self-management programs and then have things that are much more specific. So for physio, for example, um, the program that I've worked on is, is very specific to physical activity because that's, so it, it would suit someone that has that as something that they want to change, but it may not be right for someone who's wanting to change diet, for example, or wanting to know how to understand their medication use. Um, but it may even be that with lots of these different options, people can sort of tap into different programs at different points as they become, you know, useful to them. Um, so I just thought I'd sort of put those things out for discussion. Thank you for this uh, valuable addition. And I also think maybe one other point, self-management is not maybe not the best option in every patient so we also have to identify patients that are um, that we that's that for which self-management is a good option so we also <coughs> have to take into account that yes uh, good morning everyone thank you uh, this is Jay Kenneth from uh, Malta thank you for the excellent presentations uh, what I would like to ask is something that we discussed or started already with regards to applications mobile phone applications um, if if we look at these diaries, like pain diaries, would you think that they would be beneficial or we would be f putting a lot of focus on the pain as opposed to self-managing? Or can we combine both, whereby we break the barrier between uh, thinking retrospectively when you're doing the assessment? So the patient comes, he says, for example, four days ago I was in a lot of pain possibly that pain application would break the bond or find some uh, factors that might be increasing the pain, hence helping the self-management. So what do you think? Would they be of benefit or they would be of uh, hindrance? Well, I, I think I was the person that um, sort of is advocating that we should use self-monitoring. I, I was doing it specifically in relation to function. Um, that particular monitoring of pain is not my area of expertise, so I don't know about you, Nicola. Well, I, think from our, um, I, I guess the relevance from our interventions are getting individuals to reflect on how their, their symptoms are feeling um, in order to determine the amount of exercise that they choose to do. So symptoms doesn't just have to be pain. It, it can be how, how tired an individual is feeling, stiff, just have they had enough? So, so I wouldn't say it was an overly focus on, on pain, and particularly as um, our primary outcome measures are always based around function, um, because we accept that people's pain may not shift very much at all, but it's definitely about how you respond in relation to, to how your pain is, really. So, so certainly not a focus on, on levels of pain. Um, Senorina. I actually had a, a slide which I removed this morning, but there was a study conducted in Australia, but not by my research group, that looked at what goals patients with chronic low back pain had set and what they were expecting from their physiotherapy intervention. And the goals were in domains of physical activity, work, coping skills, sleep and energy. And if you think about it, none of those include pain. So I think sometimes there is an overemphasis on pain. I do not have any addition, and I, this is uh, 10 o'clock, so I would like to thank you for being here. First, I would like to you to notice this other session about self-management, so after you, if you are really interested in self-management, you can uh, have a look at that session. And I would like to thank you for being here, and thank you for your attention. <laughs>